it's good to be up here with you guys again, and I love the chance we can just say hi to each other and catch up for a little bit. We're in a, we're in a series, and it's called Home, and we've been saying this, and I know there's been a lot of vacations, so every week I try to give a little bit of a re- recap of where we've been. For some of us, maybe this is your first time at church, maybe it's your first time at Grace, back at Grace, maybe you got back from vacation, but we've been in this series called Home. And when we moved in here and opened up about five, six weeks ago, we said that we had to relearn how to do community. You know, you don't go into quarantine for over a year and sometimes get out of rhythm and and kind of forget how we do community together. And so what we've been talking about, too, is that you can have a house but not a home. Everybody knows that. You can have a house at the end of the cul-de-sac. You can have the house in the street of dreams, and it might look good on the outside. It might have all the best technology, but you can have a house. It's still not a home. A home is made by the people inside and how we live in relationship with each other. And hopefully, we live in relationship in the context of how God defines relationships. And when we do that, now not only do we just have a home, but we have a heavenly home. We have a home that God wants to bless, that God wants to empower, God wants to help us even navigate some of the hardest things in relationships. So we are a family, and you're going to see through this whole series that Jesus even defines, that the whole Bible really leads us to the conclusion that the church is not a congregation. I don't know if you know that. Church is not just a, a gathering, it's not a meeting, it's not an event, it's not, as much as it might seem like those things, we're really actually called to be a family. That's why the number one way we identify each other is as brothers and sisters, that's the family language that we have. So every week we've been talking about these one another's. Now if, you, if you're new to this, all throughout the New Testament, over a hundred times there's a phrase, and it's repeated, one another, one another, one another, but it's always given an, an insight, a blueprint on how to do relationships. For instance, sometimes you might read, love one another. Sometimes you might read, be humble with yourself towards one another, or forgive one another, or encourage one another. Last week we talked about admonishing, or teaching, or, or coaching one another. So today we're going to talk about probably, I think, one of the one another's that we failed miserably at during COVID. <laughs> How's that for a starter? You got everybody's attention. Let me just take you. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 12, 25. And we're going we're gonna to start off with the words of Jesus, and then we're going to get into the words of Paul. We're going to kind of hunker down probably in, in one or two passages. But here's, what, here's the words of Jesus. Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be Ruined. And now watch the language. Jesus is really, really brilliant because he moves from the kingdom language, which for many of us have been around church, you talk about the kingdom, there might be a little bit of an understanding, but maybe some of us are going, what kind of kingdom is he talking about? So now he, he brings it into a context that all of us would understand because he talks about home and family. Then he says it this way. He says, and every city, or here's the word, household. Everybody say household. Every household divided against itself will not stand. So Jesus is kind of giving a heads up to probably what most of us would say is obvious. Yeah, a divided house can't stand. Now you might think of it in terms of like your own personal house. That's why this message will be a huge relevant application to you personally, whatever home life you're coming from, your your immediate family. But he's also talking about in the context of all of us, the bigger family, the church. So we have to understand that a house or a household divided cannot stand, because that's how the enemy likes to work. Did you guys know that there is a conspiracy? Some people was like, Jai, you was right. <laughs> Let's go flash back to the Garden Eden. Would you, would you agree there was a conspiracy in the Garden Eden? To put a division between Adam and Eve against each other, but even worse than that, Adam and Eve against God, humanity against God. The word conspiracy comes from the word or language to conspire, but it means to have a plot against something. So could we agree, if you, if you read your Bible, and some of you are like, I don't need to read my Bible to know that the enemy is always plotting, conspiring. You get to the New Testament in, in the book of Matthew, and it talks about Herod, who was a political figure at the time of Jesus. He carried kind of a religion. He was considered the king of the Jews, but it was more of a political figurehead. Then you had the Pharisees, which were the religious group. And it actually tells us in the Gospels that the Herodians, those who belonged to Herod's political group, and then the religious leader, it actually says these words, they had conspired together to kill Jesus. 
which we know that's exactly what happened. You follow the trials of Jesus, how he was arrested, how he went to the cross, but aren't you glad that Jesus said, I can overcome what they're against me with? So what man uses against us, God, God can use. God can be bigger than that. But Jesus knew that. Jesus knew because if you remember in the context, even, even Peter wanted to try to hold back. And Peter wanted to hold back and he grabbed the sword of the one soldier and he's like, Jesus, I got your back. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, no, he said, Satan, addressing Peter, get behind me. You have the things of man in your mind and your heart, not the things of God. So like it's really easy at times for us to understand that, that, that the enemy wants to divide your household. This is really important. If I was doing a marriage series right now, I would look at every married couple in the room and say, your spouse is not your enemy. Now I know at times it feels that way. But sometimes we got to get on the same team. Because a house divided against itself cannot stand. Same thing in the church. What does the enemy want to do? enemy wants to... Still kill and destroy, but the way he does that is through divisiveness, through division. This is why Paul later on, he says this in Galatians. This is the passage we're going to like really kind of break down today. Some of y'all like, you know, I give a lot of scripture on Sunday. Some people are like, can we just hang in like one address? <laughs> can we like hang in one address? We're going to hang in this one address, maybe a couple others. Galatians chapter 5, let me kind of bookend it for us. I'm going to start with how he opens it and then how he kind of ends it. And then we'll, we'll get in the meat in between it. But this is what he says in Galatians chapter 5. He opens with this. My brothers and sisters. There's the family language. So he's talking to them as a family. And then we'll skip some of the meat. We'll come back to that. And then he makes this next statement towards the end, verse 15. He says, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Now, there was a lot of conflict that was happening in this time, and they were being divided. He's trying to bring them back together again. And he says, listen, brothers and sisters, I need to talk to you. I need to remind you, y'all brothers and sisters. And then he says, be careful, because you're actually going to chomp down on each other. You're going to devour each other. And he uses actually pretty graphic language here. He really is referring to like wild beasts that are devouring with, with their fangs and tearing meat apart. And so I started doing some, some research. Because when I, when I read this passage this week, you know what, what came to my mind? It was not only animals that devour other tribe animals, like a lion and a gazelle. They don't play well together. <laughs> but they're kind of from different tribes, right? They're different, different animal groups, different packs, different families, if you will. But then I started going, I wonder if there's any animals that actually eat from their own pack. And I found out that there was. I found out a phrase. It's called cannibal animals. <laughs> Y'all know that it existed? Cannibal animals. I did not know that. I was shocked that a rabbit is considered a cannibal animal. There you go. Aren't you glad you came to church today? You learned something. Cannibal animal, a rabbit. And I started doing, well, I don't want to talk about rabbits because that would probably offend a lot of people because they're too cute. So I, I looked up what the number one cannibal animal that would probably make sense to most of us is called the sand tiger shark. I've got a picture of one right here. Now, when you see that one, you go, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> makes sense. He looks like a cannibal animal. Fangs and the teeth, the eyes. Beady little eyes, all that. And interestingly enough, they actually begin to eat their own while they're in the womb of the mom. They do. It's trippy. It's like, oh, you thought Shark Week, man. You came to church and you're like, Shark Sunday? They actually, while they're in the womb, because the interesting thing is these sharks breed with other males. And so some of the offspring have different dads. And so as a way of surviving, they, they will tell it's crazy stuff. This comes from the fall of, uh, in the Garden of Eden. This is, what happened, this is what sin looks like right there. Sin manifested and shark babies turning on each other. But this is, what, this is why the image that Paul wants us to have here. He said, some of you, you're like ripping, you guys are, are, are cannibal animals. Some of you, the way that you talk to each other, some of you, the way that you, you handle your affairs and relationships with each other, you you're just got these sharp fangs. And he, and he says, you're, you're devouring each other. Like, what are you doing? So here's an interesting thing. When I was a kid, we grew up in Southern California, 
uh, kind of, for those who don't know, the Ventura area, kind of on the beach. We grew up with my dad would take us fishing about three times a week. We'd get up with the tide sometimes three o'clock in the morning, and we'd go out and we'd do surf fishing, jetty fishing, marina, like whatever, any of the piers. We just love to do all kinds. Of, and one of my favorite things about fishing in the ocean, you don't know what you're going to get. When you fish in the ocean, I mean, around here, you fish in a river, you're like, okay, I got a salmon, maybe a sturgeon, but they don't got teeth like that. They look like that. They don't got teeth like that. But when you fish in the ocean, you catch anything. And I would, I'll never forget the first time my brother caught a shark because it got real close in the boat. And you could get real close, and you see those fangs. Those, they will turn on you fast. And you think, this is what sharks do. Sharks pretend like they're dead until you pet them. Then they turn on you, and then you got to call first aid. So they, I remember like fishing and catching these things and seeing them firsthand. But you know, there's a technique that we would do to get sharks into a feeding frenzy. And some of you might know this. It's called chumming. Now, chumming is what you do. It's kind of disgusting, but it's awesome at the same time. You basically get a bucket full of like fish guts and blood and maybe chicken liver and nasty stuff the butchers throw out. You get all that stuff. You throw it in a bucket and you go out in the water and you, it's called chumming. You literally throw that nasty stuff out there in the water and then the fish, the sharks, whatever you're fishing for, the prey, they smell it. They can taste it. They come in and they start feeding. And some, some species will even feed and they get caught up so much in the frenzy and over the jealousy and the fighting over the food, they actually will turn on each other. They get, they get cannibal. Let me tell you this. Satan loves to chum the water. Satan loves to chum the water. I believe the last... 14, 15 months of COVID, Satan did a lot of chumming in the church. And I, I wrote down this, because I, I could go all day, but I wrote down five ways that the enemy chums the water to get us to devour each other. Number one is this, he likes to chum your ego. Put that, tweet that out. <laughs> chum your ego. He loves to get you stirred up. He loves to make you think that you're right or it's all about you. Number two is this, woo. Chumming with the politics. Oh, man, would you all agree this last year was a lot of chumming around politics. And you see believers, Jesus followers, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Throw some politics in the water. It's true. True. Some of us didn't even make it. Number three. Chum me to preferences, right, which is just another manifestation of ego and narcissism. It's all about me, the way I want it. Things should be done accommodating me. Another one up here is the chum of offense. Man, everybody's offended by everything today, right? You look at somebody on the freeway, you just wanted to say hi. All offended. Why'd you look at me like that? You drive a big truck. You must hate me because I drive a Prius. I was just wanting to say hi. I just, I just wanted to say hi. You're all offended. Must have a chip on your shoulder. I love Prius drivers. You're smarter than me because you get better gas mileage, that's for sure. How about this next one, the chum of payback? Everybody wants payback. Everybody wants payback. Everybody wants payback. Everybody wants payback, right? You did this to me, I'm going to get you back. You said this to me on Facebook, I'm going to say this back to you. I just read this morning out of just, I don't know why I do this. I always have to cleanse my soul after I read the people of Wilsonville Facebook thing. Somebody arguing today about people riding bikes on the road. Ooh, chum the water. You know what I'm talking about. That's why you're laughing, because you know it's true. <laughs> you got to come back and say that more often. <laughs> Are you visiting in town for a while? Okay. We'll hang out again this week. It's good when friends come back to visit. Let me read this to you. Paul says something that I think is real important. I'm going to fill in the blank. Because we started with him addressing as brothers and sisters, and then he kind of says, stop devouring, stop turning on each other, stop getting caught up in the chumming, if I can say that, of what the enemy and society and culture is trying to get you to do. Because don't forget something. Jesus said in John 17, Jesus said, Father, may they, that's us, be one. May they be one. He's talking about you all, like us all. May we be united, not divided. Jesus prayed this, prayer for us. He said, may they be one, Father, as we are one, because we're good, 
We're, we're unified. And then he said this, so that the world will know you sent me. So what's at stake when we're not unified, or what's at stake if we're tearing each other apart, the world doesn't know Jesus. Which, which if I could turn that around, what I would say is the way that we unify, honor each other, love each other, even give space for people to disagree but respect each other, and the way we handle the affairs of these tough times, then I will turn it around because if we divide and the world doesn't know Jesus, isn't it possible that if we unify, the world will know Jesus? Because they see something different when the water's been chummed in culture and society, but instead of chewing on each other, we love on each other. And all of a sudden the world goes, well, that's different. What is that? I want to get in their waters. I want to be, I want to be a part of their, their, their family. I want that. So listen to this. So Paul, he fills it in, right? Here's what he says, though, because I'm going to tell you what they were kind of getting all messed up about. So let me read the whole context to you. Let's go back to verse 13. He says this. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Everybody say free. You were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Some translations say, or don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. We'll talk about that in a second. But he says it this way. This is good. Rather, everybody say rather. It's like this is like now the solution, what we're supposed to do. Serve one another humbly in love for the entire law, meaning the whole Bible, is fulfilled in keeping this one command. In other words, what does it all come down to is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then right after that, he says, if you bite each other, devour each other, you understand where he's going with that. So in between, you got to ask the question because he talks about freedom here. Now, freedom is a big deal. It's a really big deal. And as much as I'd love to talk about the importance that it is for us to have freedom in a country like this, and I, I could, I, you could see where I could springboard, but I'm trying to be integrity to the text. You all know what I'm talking about? Because I, I would love to talk about that because I believe freedom is important. Hugely important. I'm a big fan of a free nation, okay? But if I was a springboard on that, I wouldn't be actually preaching the context of this. I have, I have to, my own integrity, stay to this. That's called exegeting the passage, Okay? So what the freedom he's talking about here is not necessarily like freedom as a nation. He's talking about freedom from the law. So what was happening was Jesus came in and abolished this thing called legalism, which I think is awesome that Jesus abolished that. Because what legalism says is if you want to be right with God, you got to be perfect. Jesus came and said, it's not about your perfection, it's about my perfection that I bestow upon you just by you believing in me. That's all you got to do. You don't have to be perfect, you just have to believe in me. It's called grace through faith, not by works. So Jesus shows up on the scene. He takes all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the commandments of the law that were brutalizing people, beating. They were judging each other. Why aren't you living this way? you got to be perfect, 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 perfect. Jesus shows up. He fulfills the law so that we can live under grace. But the problem was that some of them were going, wait a minute, wait a minute. What? This is really cool. You mean... I, I, I get to come to Jesus and salvation is free, not by works, this thing called grace. And some were going, so you mean I can sin and, and keep sinning and Jesus will still hold on to me and never let me go? Yeah, that's true. Wait a minute, I found a loophole in the whole sin thing. Because that means that I can keep sinning and he'll just keep forgiving me. That means that I can have everything, cake and eat it. I can have Jesus and I can serve my flesh. Some of them were practicing that. So they'd show up at church on Sunday morning, Jesus, we'd love you, love you, love you. And then they'd be hitting out the clubs the next day doing what they shouldn't be doing. Or, or they'd been ripping people off in their business. Like they know they shouldn't be. But Sunday would be like this, right? And some of them were like, but I can, you know, he forgives me. And it was a license to sin. So Paul has to address this like, man, you guys are taking this freedom to do whatever you want. By grace, you're taking it now, you're using it as an abuse over each other. You're actually taking advantage of each other. You're not feeling any remorse for any of the things you've done, but you're all, oh, it's grace. It's grace. You're, you're saying things to people, and instead of feeling this sense of like, man, I should probably go back and say what I said was wrong. Grace, you just got to, I can say whatever I want, do whatever I want, because, ah, grace is good. They were abusing that in, in, in the beauty of freedom. That's the freedom he's talking about here. He's like, don't use your freedom as justification. The problem is this, though. Let me say this. I think we end up in two extremes. Let me just paint two extremes. On the one extreme, 
is this idea of a license to sin, right? Like I can love Jesus and I can love the flesh at the same time. I can love Jesus and then I can just do whatever I want and expect that he can clean up all the consequences of that. That's this extreme, right? The other extreme is this thing called legalism. And, and a lot of us still actually probably fall into that. So here's the thing. Back in the 1600s, the monks had to deal with something. There was, a, I would say, a pandemic, a different one, a spiritual pandemic in the 1600s. But I think it's actually come up again. And it was something called scrupulosity. That's a big word. Some of you are going to Google it right now. Go ahead. Scrupulosity, if you look it up, literally means religious or spiritual OCD. Look it up. Because they, there was a movement amongst the 1600s where a lot of the priests were imposing upon people. And, and there was this monk lifestyle that they would like, oh man, I got to be perfect. 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 Everybody's like, I got to read a certain amount of verses a time of the day. I got to spend so many hours in prayer. I got to pray a certain amount of times a day. I got to go to confession a certain amount of times a day. And they were just living in the weight of that. And many of us today would say, man, I don't have scrupulosity. But a lot of us, if you live every day thinking you've got to be perfect, you have spiritual OCD. Because some of you have a perfectionist mentality. I do to an extent too. So these are these extremes, right? You can be over here. And Paul's trying to say, listen, there's a sweet spot. And it's called liberty, freedom, and love. Where we get to live a life of grace. But we don't just get to use that as an excuse to do whatever we want. And so then he goes on to say this. He's like, don't use your freedom as a way. Now watch this next word. As an opportunity for the flesh. Now the word opportunity there. In the, in the Greek language, which is the context here, the word opportunity is a military word. The word opportunity, it means to have a strategic military base in a right place to take out an, a, a, an offense against your enemy. What he's saying here is, listen, when we use God's grace as a license to do whatever I want, what I'm actually doing is I'm setting up a spiritual base for my flesh and the enemy to set an assault against my soul. So if I go through my life just thinking, well, God's great, I can do whatever I want and God's always just going to forgive me, which he does. But if I abuse that as a license to do whatever I want, I'm actually setting up a spiritual offense against my own soul is what he's saying. So he's like, don't do that. Now, here's what he says. I love this next statement. He says, rather, everybody say rather again. Don't, he's like, don't get caught up in that. Rather, here's the solution, serve one another. Serve one another. I love that statement. Serve one another. To serve, most of us would say, okay, I think I got, I think I got the understanding of serve. Serve means to do what? Serve. In the Greek, it means serve. It's not complicated. Serving one another. Like, like let me give you an example. So like on a Sunday morning, we have dozens, if not hundreds, of volunteers that serve all of us to make this experience happen. Aren't we grateful for them? Can we just give it up for those that are doing that? Seriously. I mean, we got so many people who are in the back, who are with our kids, with our kids, helping us park, helping us get coffee, helping us get our seats, helping up on the team and the sound. I mean, I can go through the list. There's so many people all to make this amazing experience with God happen because they've said, hey, we're, we're going to serve. Because, you know, every community, you, this is kind of interesting. Most homes, like most households, if you're, if you're a good household, everybody kind of serves in the home, right? Sometimes it's hard as parents to get our kids, some of y'all kids in here, some of you 22-year-old, 3-year-olds living at home, Need, need to understand, right? Like, we all got to pitch in, right? Somebody's got to do the dishes. Somebody's got to wash the clothes and the laundry and all of that. Like, everybody contributes. But, but in this context, there was some people who were like, no, we're just going to, it's all about me because it's serving the flesh. Like, they, they just serve me. So there's a context where in its simplest understanding, I'm going to get to another complicated understanding, but in the most simplest way of serving one another just means where there's a need, I, I jump in and I, I help contribute in a way that benefits other people. That's, it's pretty elementary. In fact, I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to do that. So how would you like that setup? So there's a card on your seats. And here's what I would say. I'm going to take two, like 30 seconds to say this. On this card, honestly, there's two areas we do need a lot of help to make this experience what it is. It's working with our kids and helping in the area of hospitality. All we're asking is this. 
if you can consider, you're not signing up or committing to anything when you fill this out. What you're saying is, I'm just interested in finding out more. Because then our teams will follow up with you, give you the information, let you know more details of schedule, all the thing, questions you probably have. All you're saying is, you know what? I don't just want to be someone that consumes here. I want to be someone that contributes. If that's an area you need help, we will consider that. So if you would just be as kind enough to like say, hey, I want to consider that, fill it out. Ben will be out here at the door on the way out. You can just slip it in the basket there. If you have questions, you could ask him. No pressure. In fact, I would say some of you, you need to just stay and heal. You, you've been serving somewhere and you got burnt out or whatever. I would say, no, you probably need to just come and soak and heal and just be served. But for many of us, we need to step in and we can help and serve. So I want to say that because that is one basic understanding of serve. Let me take it up a notch. The word serve in this context actually means to submit. Ooh, he just used that S word, didn't he? It means to submit to one another. Now, the word submit means I literally am choosing your preference over mine. That's what submit means. So I'll give you a context. So, like, my wife has some dietary restrictions. I do not. <laughs> she cannot have gluten. I have it on drip. I got a stash of gluten somewhere. So when we want to go out to eat, there's always a conversation, which you probably have, where, where are we going to go? What are we going to have? Where are we going to go? What are we going to have? And the idea behind that is, okay, let's choose. But some restaurants accommodate both of us, but a lot don't. And there's been so many times my most amazing wife will look at me and go, you know what? Let's go to a place that you can really enjoy that usually has a lot of roasted meat. And she does that amazing thing which says, I'll have a salad. I'm like, you're going to get a salad? I'm going to get half a pig. <laughs> now, she loves that too. But the point is, like, submit means you are, you are literally choosing to set aside your preference to elevate somebody else's. And there's times I do the exact same thing. It's, it's, you know, how, how can I come? You know, I'm going to come and serve at your restaurant that, that serves you, I'm going to submit to you because the Bible actually, just so newsflash, the Bible actually calls us. Do you, know, do you know that everybody, that verse where it talks about wives submit to your husband, do you know the verse before that says everybody all submit to each other? Some of the wives didn't know that, now you're armed. <laughs> submit to one another. It means to give preference to, to one another. And then he goes on to say this. He says serve one another, but watch this, in the context he says, out of humility, he says, serve one another humbly and in love. Serve one another humbly and in love. And then he goes on to say, and I, I just want to emphasize this. He says, serve one another humbly and in love. Verse 14, he says this, for the entire law, we've just read this, is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. So what he says is, listen, the way that you serve one another is through humility. It means to consider other people before you. It means to put other people. Let me just read this one. Hold your finger. Philippians 2, speaking of Jesus. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but to each other's interest. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, who left heaven to come serve ultimately by laying his life down, the best of our interests, which was our salvation. So, so what he's saying is the, the mindset, the vision, the standard of humility, how we serve one another, is Jesus going to the cross. Like that, that should be just newsflash. As a husband or as a wife, that should be my vision for how I treat my, my, one, my other. How do I serve humbly? How do I put aside my preferences or my choices or, or, or my rights or what are those things? That's a beautiful way to come and say, I, I want to lift you up. I want to consider. I want to put myself in your shoes. How can, I, how can I help you? Because listen, he says all of this is the way that the whole Bible gets summarized in this one word called love. Because he says, listen, we've said this, this is why the first Sunday we started the series was love one another. Because it's the foundation of all the one another's. In fact, let me just illustrate it this way. Because you've probably been wondering why there's a golf club up here. I want you to imagine that this golf bag, specifically, purposely, I picked. Because it's the brand Titleist, which I'll talk about in a moment. But inside this golf bag, you have different clubs. And anybody that's played golf, and even if you haven't, you probably can understand that each club in the bag has a specific purpose. 
So when you go and play a round of golf, you're going to end up in different situations. You might be in the tee box where you got to get a lot of distance, and so you're going to pull out the driver to try to give you the most distance that you can get. But then you end up sometimes in a bunker. you got to pull out a different club, not this one, but this one, because this one's designed in such a way to help in that specific circumstance so that you can take advantage of the way this is designed to get you out of that situation. And then hopefully, hopefully, you end up on the green where you pull your putter out, not your driver. But your putter was designed for your finesse. It was not designed to be hitting the, hitting the ball long. Every club in here has a specific purpose. Let me say it this way. All the one another's represent a specific club in the bag. And when you go through life in relationship with one another, we have so many tools, clubs that God's given to us to use in every situation. I would say it this way. For some of us, we are in the sand. And you need some encouragement. And so as we encourage one another, because you're struggling, you're, you're discouraged. Nobody gets excited when they get in the sand. No one's like, I hit in the sand. There's no applause from the gallery when they hit it in the sand. You're defeated. You're like, what am I doing here? How am I going to get out of this? So you need a specific club for that. That's where the idea of I'm going to come and encourage you. I'm going to come alongside you. And when this club is used in the best way possible, I can lift you out of there. For some of us, though, we need to forgive one another, which is a lot more finesse. Way more up close and personal. you got to sometimes read the relationship. How are we going to forgive? Which way is it going to break? you got to be very careful. you got to take your time forgiving one another. But when it's done right, you can drop the ball in for a birdie. For some of us, I'm just going to tell you this right now, we need to get a lot of mileage out of relationships. And I think the driver is humility. You get more distance out of a relationship with a posture of humility. You come alongside somebody, not saying, I'm right, I'm right, you're wrong. But when we humble ourselves with one another, because that's the mindset of Christ, you get so much mileage out of your marriage. You get so much mileage out of parenting when you look at your kids and admit to them that you're wrong as a parent, to ask them for forgiveness. It mends the soul. The humility does so much good for relationships. That's what Paul's saying. we got to have a spirit of humility. But here's the big thing. Jesus said, Jesus said, the one thing that should define us as Jesus' followers should be what? How we what? Love one another. He said, they will know that you are my followers by the way you love one another. Because guess what the word titleist means? It means the champion, the title owner. If we as the church are going to have the title of being the most loving expression of heaven on earth, then we've got to walk in humility. We've got to forgive one another. We've got to be gracious and encouraging one another. We've got to serve one another. And when we do that, we will emerge as the champions in the face of darkness. We need a church, come on, we need a church that's not afraid to walk in humility when the world wants us to chew each other up. So can we say no chum in the waters? Let's bring out the big drive of humility because we'll get a lot more distance out of that and watch how the spirit of Christ will work and manifest to all of us because the Bible says greater love had no one than what? They lay down their life for the other. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take communion right now because I think in, in light of Jesus' ultimate expression of humility, I think when Jesus went to the cross, he pulled out the driver and he sent his humility and love through all eternity. You and I are here today because of, of that expression of his love on the cross for us, that he served us humbly. And so as we take communion... If you've never done these before, I'll just walk you through it. There's two layers. You just take off the clear top one, and you grab the wafer, which represents Jesus' body that he humbly sacrificed on the cross. Jesus made a point of it to tell his disciples, don't forget what I did. Remember it frequently, over and over. Like, like when we take communion, this isn't a ritual. This isn't a, a scrupulosity thing that I do to check a box. This is about a heart moment to come into alignment. Jesus, maybe I'm not living the humble way that you would. Would you, would you help me do it? As I reflect right now on what you've done on the cross, 
May you do that through me. So let's take this wafer, the bread, in representation of his body. Let's take it together. And grab the cup, tear back the next layer, and inside is the juice, which represents the wine, the blood that Jesus referenced, that he poured out, spilt out, as another expression of his love for us. And Jesus said to remember. So right now, let's let our hearts come into alignment as we reflect on his blood poured out for us. Let's take it together. And as we go into this time of worship, let me leave you with this thought. One of those golf clubs that represents the one another's in your hands, you may say, I'm not very good, I'm not very athletic, I'm not very spiritual. But in the hands of the Holy Spirit, surrendering our lives to him, the Holy Spirit can manifest his expertise of the nature and character of Christ through all of us. So as we go to this next week, maybe it's Holy Spirit, help me. Because I don't have the humility of Jesus to treat others or to treat my family or my spouse or in my home group or where I work. Holy Spirit, help me. Give, give me the fruit that you can produce in my life, the patience and the, the love and the self-control that I would even be able to hold my tongue and not say things out of the gate that would be harmful. But Holy Spirit, would you help me? Would you live the very essence of Jesus through me as I express humility and love as we serve one another? Jesus, so as we go into this time of worship, I ask you, Holy Spirit, would you right now captivate our hearts and minds and may this be a time to repent, a time to return, a time to, to turn to you. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to overflow, fill us up now as we center our hearts and our affections back on you. I believe that you can fill us up and recharge us. I pray for supernatural humility, supernatural serving and love that only you can do through us in the places that we feel that we can. I pray for testimonies of redemption as we do this. In Jesus, all for your glory. In your name we pray, amen.